Law Enforcers of Reddit. What is the craziest, you'll never believe me, story that a suspect or victim told you that actually turned out to be true? Not official cop work, but very related. I used to be an instructor for the security forces, USAF cops, students in training. I was a firearms instructor, but we dealt a lot with the dorm inspections and all that other fun stuff. Well, this one kid kept falling asleep in class. After many counselings and some paperwork, he said he couldn't sleep because the devil was in his dorm room. Of course, maybe we thought he had some mental issues going on, but decided to get to the bottom of things. He said every night around midnight or later, he would hear a voice saying to keep his eyes shut and nothing would happen to him. He was freaked out, so he complied. A couple of the instructors decided to sit with him in his room one night, and told him to go to bed like he usually does. Well, lo and behold, around 0100, the instructors heard something in the ceiling. They started freaking out a bit, but watched and waited. Next thing they know, they heard the voice, and one of the ceiling tiles was moved, and something jumped down. They flipped the frick out and turned on all the lights to see what the hell was going on. Apparently, this other kid had been kicked out of the military while in training. He didn't want to go home and face his family, so every night he'd go into that kid's room and scare the crap out of him. Then he'd take some food or whatever and stretch his legs a bit. I guess he would shower during the day but stayed up in the ceiling for the rest of the time. Needless to say, he was promptly sent home, and our freaked out student was finally able to get some much needed rest. Edit. A few things I want to clarify. Yes, the kid was 18. I referred to all the students as kids since I've been in for about 15 years. This happened around 2011-2012 at the firehouse, which is what we call that set of dorms. Dude living in the ceiling would say other stuff to the kid, leading him to believe that he was the devil and that he would hurt his family or some other stuff. And for those asking why an 18-year-old would be such a wuss, I have to say you would be surprised at the caliber of students that came through training. They don't all get weeded out in BMT, which is sad. But a lot of them do grow into fantastic airmen and eventually NCOs. I can't believe it took this kid this long to say something. And to believe on the first instinct to be like, oh yeah, it's the devil. That's crazy, man. I better keep this to myself. Don't want people thinking I'm crazy or something. Just a tip, everybody, if the devil starts talking to you, I would encourage you to talk to someone about it. Just in case. Story 2. So dispatch advises my partner and I of a 911 call, where the caller advises you there's a pilot who parked a plane in his yard and then went to a nearby bar. Dispatch advises the caller doesn't speak conversational English and the call was translated via translation service. Knowing the address is on a lake, I assume there's a mistranslation. Someone probably drove a boat up to his dock and went into the bar. Partner calls me, he's on the crapper and he's gonna be imminent. He assumes the same thing regarding translation that I do. I arrive first. Holy crap! It's an actual plane in his driveway. Specifically, a seaplane. Apparently it was driven up the boat ramp, turned off into his driveway, and shut down. I call my partner. Yeah, you need to come here and see this crap. Go to the bar. Who owns the plane? Drunk guy does. Apparently he was there to visit his friend, landed on the lake, and taxied to his friend's driveway. Except he got his addresses mixed up. And now he's drunk, so I don't even want him to move the plane. Turns out planes are light. He pushed it to the correct driveway. Story 3. Obligatory not me, but a close family friend. So I'm patrolling in beach tourist to destination, and it's about 2am, so I'm on the lookout for drunk drivers. There's a guy swerving a bit up the road. He was on a back road and there was nobody else around. I decide to check it out. Flip on the lights and the guy pulls over immediately. Start chatting with the guy and he's slurring his words. Where are you coming from? Just heading back to the hotel from the beach. Any reason why you're swerving? I'm on some medication from a surgery I recently had and I'm pretty tired. So I'm thinking, okay buddy. I grab his license and registration, I run it and it comes back clean. Take a look in his backseat with my flashlight on the way back. Not only are there 230 packs of beer in the backseat, the floor is absolutely littered with empty beer cans. So, what's with all the beer in the back? Well, my neighbor really likes that brand of beer and he was house-sitting for us, so we're bringing some back to him as a gift. So what's with all the cans on the floor? Well, while we were at the beach the other day, we saw a part of the beach that was trashed. I couldn't leave the beach like that. All right, buddy, you need to step out of the car. So I make him take a breathalyzer and he blows 0, 0.000. So I make him blow again. 0. 0. 0.000. Keep in mind this guy's slurring his words left and right. So I ask him if I can take him back to the hotel and I'll drive his wife back to pick up his car and he agrees. I get to the hotel and the wife is worried sick because he'd been out so late. The wife confirms he's on medication. He goes to sleep and as the wife and I are walking out, I start to question her. I saw a bunch of empty beer cans in the back seat. Does he drink a lot? Oh no, he insisted we spend an hour of our beach trip cleaning up the beach. He wanted to drop off the cans at the recycling center before we go back home. He doesn't drink at all. Interesting. There were two cases of beer in the back seat. Oh yes, my neighbor absolutely loves the beer. Can't get it where we're from. 
Easily the most surprised I've ever been. Edit. It wasn't the medication making him swerve, he was just really tired. Hence why he was driven back to the hotel and not arrested. The medication made him slur his speech. Yeah, with those excuses, I would also think that he's lying, to be honest. And hey, good on OP's family friend for dealing with this in a responsible way. But this also does go to show that impaired driving doesn't just mean drunk. If you're really tired, it can be just as bad. Be careful when driving out there, everybody. Story 4. Three years ago working in our civil department. Landlord wants his tenants out. Says the usual things that set off the BS meter. They're drug users, criminals, thugs, keeping a prisoner in the mother-in-law suite. Landlord himself is a slumlord. Says outrageous stuff for all of his tenants he wants to evict. Turns out, in this case, it was actually true partially. The tenants were a man and his elderly mother. They were keeping the man's developmentally challenged brother padlocked in the mother-in-law suite of the house with no plumbing or electricity. This family had been doing a rent-to-own thing with the landlord for ten years or so, and only recently stopped paying. Turns out they'd been feeding the brother through the mail slot in the suite's door, and the interior had no furniture besides the most disgusting mattress you can imagine. We don't know how long he'd been kept in there, but I have never seen a more revolting place in my life. Story 5. These aren't my pants! As we were cruising around town, we spotted a guy, Jim, wanted for questioning in relation to breaching an intervention order. He was in the passenger seat of a car with some other guy we didn't know, Bob. We pulled the car over, arrest Jim, and put him in the back of our car. As we're searching his car and Bob, Jim was one of our local drug dealers, I find a point of ice in Bob's pocket. So I'm telling Bob he's under arrest for drugs. He looks me dead in the eyes and says, Officer, I swear to God, these are not my pants. I almost laughed in his face. You can't be serious. That's the best you can come up with. But again, he said, I swear to God, these are not my pants and those are not my drugs. Apparently, Jim and Bob had a big night drinking at Jim's house, and Bob had misplaced his pants before passing out. When they woke up, Bob grabbed the first pair of jeans he found and drove Jim into town for some makas, totally unaware of the drug in his pocket. A likely story if I've ever heard one. So I open up our car and ask Jim, Are they your pants? Yeah, they are. He couldn't find his own. Can you tell me anything about what was in those pants? Oh, crap, yeah, the, the point that I didn't smoke yesterday. Jim made full admissions of owning the pants and the drugs, and Bob was happily free to go. Story 6. A frequent flyer would call in at least once a week, telling us people wanted to bang him and wouldn't leave him alone. We would send someone out there and he would always be alone and it would be unfounded. One night he called and said he was at the store and a man keeps asking to have oral with him. We go out there and there's nobody else there, but he said the person left and gave us a license plate that had a local address. We went out there and the address was for a funeral home. The vehicle was a hearse and the hood was still warm. After talking to the mortician, he confessed to soliciting the guy. For once, the guy was telling the truth, and a great example why every call has to be treated seriously. You never know when it's going to be a serious one. Annoying and a bit of a waste a lot of the time, but in situations like this, it has a purpose. Story 7. This actually happened to me, and I was very thankful for how everything turned out. I was 19 or 20 and went to Applebee's with some co-workers after a really crappy retail shift for the half-price appetizers. They were drinking and I wasn't because underage. As we're getting ready to pay, a co-worker reached over for his check and knocked over a tall beer that was damn near full straight onto my shirt and lap. No problem, it was an accident. Whatever. The staff helped me clean it up and we went on our way, but I was still reeking of Bud Light. On the very first turn out of the parking lot and onto the main road, I had to swerve to avoid what looked like a tire in the middle of the lane. And immediately I saw the police lights in the mirror and thought I was totally screwed. The officer very obviously smelled the beer, but actually took the time to listen to my story. Plus, my clothes were still damp. He took me in the back of his car back to the Applebee's to confirm the story with the staff. Luckily, they all confirmed it was just spilled beer and I hadn't been drinking. He took me back to my car and let me go. Story 8. I went to a report of a mentally disturbed person who called police reporting that the devil called and told him to end people on the street and then end himself. I checked his previous police files. He had a massive history of mental health issues. He was taken to the mental ward many times and was diagnosed with a form of paranoid schizoaffective disorder. Anyway, my partner and I show up and talk to the guy. He's sweating bullets, eyes darting around, trembling and totally terrified. He explains that for the last six years, the devil calls him nightly via telephone. And then when he calls for help, the police take him to the mental institute. He says the devil tells him to end people, then end himself. As we're about to call our mental health unit to come talk to him, the phone rings. My partner answers the phone at the guy's request, and guess what? This piece of garbage was using a voice changer, and pranking this dude with mental health issues for years pretending to be the devil. I can't tell you how surreal that moment was. The poor man's face changed. Kind of like he's finally been vindicated and knows it's not just in his head. So we investigated the pranker and eventually charged him. 
the guy who had called was so freaking happy. I can't imagine what an absurd piece of absolute trash you have to be to do something like this. Like, this just makes you one of the worst people on earth, as far as I'm concerned. I'm glad the guy actually got charged. I feel like a lot of phone pranks or whatever don't. That poor guy, man. Story 9. I know this is a little late, but it's a good one. I was a detective for a few years, assigned to a violent crimes investigation. I got called in one night for a male victim that was literally dumped out of a vehicle at the entrance to the emergency room. He had been shot in the side right around the hip area with a shotgun, but was conscious and alert. While talking to him, he wouldn't give any information whatsoever about his name or anything. While in the ER, the doctor informed me that when they cut his pants off he had a significant amount of drugs in his pocket. He initially stuck to his story, and once discharged about a week later he was arrested for the drugs. This is where the story takes the turn. He immediately dropped the those aren't my pants story, which is more common than anyone could ever imagine, but still wouldn't give more information about what actually did happen. He did finally give his personal information though. He was from out of state and couldn't make bond. So after sitting in jail for about four months, he finally decided he wanted to talk about what happened. Turns out on the night he was shot, he and some of his associates decided they were going to rob a known drug dealer. To achieve this, they dressed up as federal agents with BDU pants, full uniform style shirts, and badges. When they got to the house, they announced they were police. And as soon as he grabbed the glass door, the guy on the inside swung open the main door and fired a shotgun through the outer door, striking him. Everyone ran back to the car, jumped in, and on the way, one of the other guys gave him clothes to put on so that he didn't show up at the hospital with the uniform-style outfit. Every piece of his story was verified through the investigation, and the drug dealer hadn't replaced his glass door and it was still shattered. Well, that certainly makes sense why you wouldn't want to talk about it. Must be a tough decision at that point, because your excuse is, No, officer. I wasn't committing this crime. I didn't know about this crime. I was committing this crime instead. Armed robbery. Yikes. Story 10. I work in air pollution control. One of our actual officers got an anonymous complaint call through the tip line about a body shop that didn't have the right equipment, and it was operating without a permit, etc. Meet the officer out there to inspect the place and see what's up. As I'm pulling in, the shop's yard is a mess. Random wrecked cars all over the place. Bits and pieces of engines and such under tarps or just casually laying on a pallet. There's a small pile of tires in one corner. All that's missing is a chained up Doberman and a razor wire fence. I was glad I had an officer along. We walk into the shop proper. It's even more cluttered than the yard. There's bits and pieces of at least three different cars and old milk crates, and two different vehicles in various states of disassembly on the shop floor. Tell the owner why we're there and he's super confused. Says he has a paint booth that he loans out to a buddy who does his painting for him, but he doesn't do very much work. We go through the whole speech about changing the filters and such, and the guy's even more confused. He swears he just bought new filters for the thing, they're quite expensive. And he says again he doesn't do all that much paint work. I'm not buying it given the state of the shop and the yard, so I ask to see the booth. He walks us into another building and there's an abs absolutely beautiful paint booth in there. Everything is clean, the filters are in good shape, he's got the right kinds of paint guns, all his containers are covered, and the ventilation is hooked up properly. There's not the faintest whiff of paint, let alone some sort of odor worth calling the tip line to complain about. I couldn't find anything to cite as a violation, and there wasn't even anything to warn him about. One of the better body shops I've ever been in as far as housekeeping goes. Now we're all confused. The officer asks the guy if anyone from any other agency has been out to visit lately. The guy says no. Then he asks if maybe he fired someone lately, since sometimes former employees who get fired will call to complain and try to get their old boss in trouble. Again, the guy says no, just him and his dad that work in the shop, and his buddy that comes to paint. We scratch our heads trying to figure out who called in the complaint, because there's nothing here. On the way out, the officer casually remarks he'd like to get his hands on a Camaro like that one over there. That's when the light bulb went off. Turns out the owner of the Camaro was unhappy with the speed of progress on his car. The shop owner had been working on it for free as a favor, and had gotten bogged down with other paid work, so he hadn't gotten the chance to finish it. They had apparently argued about it a few days before we got the call, and the rest is history. Story 11. I was a counter-narcotics operator who would deploy with the US Navy and the US Coast Guard. One trip we were patrolling just off the coast of Guatemala with intel on a suspected drug trafficking boat. We locate a radar contact in the vicinity and launch a small boat, 19-ish feet, with an interdiction team. It was an unannounced nighttime boarding, UNB, so the idea was speed, surprise, and violence if action. Got close within 30 feet undetected, turned on all spotlights and strobes, and began yelling for all the people on board to put their hands in the air. The only person on board was hanging over the opposite side and wouldn't put his hands up. Several times he was instructed to do so or possibly be hurt if he refused. In all the yelling and confusion, no one heard what he was trying to tell us. Finally, the dust settled and everyone took a breath, and the man explained he couldn't put his hands up because he caught a shark and was losing most of his fishing equipment. 
I went over and saw that he indeed had a five-foot shark fighting just over the side. We helped him pull it up a little bit and he beat it to death with a baseball bat. Saved all of his tackle. Didn't find any drugs. Can you imagine what that guy was thinking? I just imagine this fisherman on the boat like, ah, just my freaking luck, man. First I'm fighting this shark and then I got the police on me. This sucks. That's an unlucky day if I've ever heard one. Story 12. Some law enforcement officers saw this happen to me. Or otherwise I might have been in trouble. I was on my way to a party with some beer cans and a shopping bag. I decide that I should open a beer on the way, only before I do, I spot some cops standing close by. So I change my mind about the beer since public drinking is illegal. I put the beer back in the bag, still looking at the cops. So I miss the bag and it falls to the ground and a small pebble punctures the can, causing it to spray. Panicked about the beer, I pick it up and try to block the hole, but spraying beer all over myself instead. After some quick thinking, I figure open the can would help alleviate the pressure from the hole, and I'm right. Only now, I'm standing in public with a half-opened beer can in hand, in broad view of the police. And I'm reeking of beer. Apart from being sober, it sure looked like I was drinking in public. The cops didn't bother with me at all. Story 13. Wasn't me, but I thought it was funny. My two buddies hike at night, I don't know why. And in our state, you get trespassing for being out after dark in parks. They see a park ranger they assume looking for them since they parked in the lot. After backtracking about a mile and a half, they have this dumb freaking idea. The one buddy starts running up the trail screaming, Help, there's a bear chasing me! The other buddy is running up the trail making a bunch of bear noises. I don't know what those would be. As my buddy is reaching the ranger, he's like, Run the other way! There's a bear! And the ranger runs out of the woods with him. LOL. Story 14. Night shift in an extremely rural part of the home counties in the UK. About 3 a.m. on a Wednesday. Call comes in that someone has pulled up to the victim in a white Range Rover, jumped out and held our informant up with a sawn-off shotgun, and their iPhone was taken about 30 yards from their own front door in a quiet residential street. Turn up to the informant's address, and I weirdly remember the street but can't place it. I go inside, and the informant is on the internet looking at new iPhones. Slightly suspicious. We talk, and he tells me what happened. He doesn't seem at all phased. As we're talking, I remember the street as I was there a few months ago for a burglary a few doors down, and had recommended the owner get CCTV. I go over there, and sure enough, there's CCTV above his garage. I wake him up and view it, and sure enough, it happened. Everything. Got the registration of the vehicle, and the RO was arrested for armed robbery. The gun turned out to be replica, but it was totally bizarre. That guy is tough as nails. Imagine getting robbed, your phone taken from you, with a gun pointed at you. And not 20 minutes later after calling the police, you're just on the internet like, well, I need a new phone now. This man sounds immune to trauma. It's either that or it would all hit him later. Who's to say? He could still be in shock. Story 15. You wouldn't believe how many calls we get about people accusing someone else of tricking them into drinking pee. It happens at least once a month and sometimes once a week. One time, it was true and we went after the guy. Some prankster called a hotel, got a guest to think he had an STD and needed to bring a cup of pee down to the front desk. He told him not to cause an alarm so just put it on the desk and walk away. Then the guy called the front desk and said that he was a sports drink CEO and had a new energy drink for him to test out. Guy drank pee. It went viral and there have been a few copycats out there. There's nothing funny about making someone drink pee, people. Story 16. Got a complaint of a burglary from a guy we deal with from time to time who has schizophrenia. Guy says someone broke into his house and stole like 38 cents in change from his coffee table, two slices of cheese from his fridge, and two Tylenol gel caps. The interior of the guy's house looks like something off of a hoarder's show. So I ignore the guy and let him fill out a statement form for an initial report that I plan to bury in a file because he's obviously having problems with not taking his psych meds. Two weeks later, he calls panicking. Dispatch back out to his house. This time, he's missing around 72 cents from his coffee table, a can of Vienna sausages, and three doses of his prescription heart medication. Same thing. I let him rant and rave about being robbed, and he repeatedly asks what he can do to stop this from happening. I give him a half-hearted answer like he should invest in cameras for his house and take a statement and leave. Another week passes, and we get sent out a third time. Same random items missing. Spare change, a fishing lure, and half a bologna sandwich from his fridge. This time, he's smiling. He pulls back a blanket from beside his recliner and it's a monitor attached to six or seven cameras around the inside of his house pulls up the video and sure enough a guy slides his kitchen window open and lets himself in he takes the change from the coffee table steals one fishing lure and takes a bite out of the dude's sandwich in the fridge before opening the fridge back up and taking half of it turns out to be another schizophrenic that lives down the road from him that must have been a good sandwich though take a bite and be like now hold on i want the rest of it I don't have much else to say about the story other than that. Just thought that detail was funny. Story 17. Not law enforcement, but still good stories. I used to be an EMT, and at the house we had a guy who'd been doing it for 15 years or so. He had some stories. The one that sticks out is this. 
They get a call for a trapped child. That's it. No further explanation. Just an address and hang up. Cops, fire trucks, ambulance, rescue squad all roll up. Mom answers the door, seems embarrassed and disheveled. Told them, in the bathroom. Her son had banged the bathtub faucet and became stuck inside. I'll repeat that. Her son had intercourse with the bathtub faucet and had gotten stuck inside. They had to cut the pipe out of the wall. They cut five feet up to try and prevent any heat transfer to his dong. The moment they started cutting, he freaked out. So they stopped. One of the guys goes, oh, we didn't nick you, buddy, did we? High five if we did. They get him in the ambulance and drape him with a sheet, roll him into the ER with what looks like the biggest frickin' hard-on ever. They had to hold the pipe while they wheeled him in, so it looked like two EMTs were holding this mondo dong. The other stories from a doc I knew had worked in the ER for 30 years. One of his nurses had been there for 25 of them. She came up to him and goes, You need to see this. Guy fell asleep with his testes in the hole of a barbell. They swelled up and were now stuck. Guy waddled into the ER clutching a bit under his sack. He went to go sit down, but the triage nurse stopped him. Yes, you, yes, you, come on through. They had to call the fire department to use the auto extrication kit. So they saw into this barbell and sparks are flying. And to reduce heat, they're dumping water. Under the curtain, you can see sparks from the metal. And the guy is screaming in terror and you hear the sound of metal cutting metal. All the patients in the ER freaked out. Several attempted to run away. Nurses, PAs, docs, and techs had to play goalie and ensure everyone it was fine. It was a medical situation in the room and torture wasn't happening. Story 18. Not a police officer personally, but my dad is. Anytime somebody asks him about his craziest story, this is his go-to. Some backstory. A guy flew into the city we're near from out of state, and rented a jeep to drive for the time he's in town. The guy takes the keys to the car, unlocked the door, and at first he was a bit thrown off, because he found an empty coffee mug in the cup holder. The guy just assumed they forgot to take it out from the last time someone rented the car, and after his time in town he came back to the parking garage only to be met with police officers, yelling orders for him to get on the ground. Confused, the man obliges. Later, while questioning him, I learned the second part to the story. Car manufacturers will sometimes make multiple cars work with the same key, so every single car doesn't have a unique key. The chances of this happening are insanely low, but the key that was given to him for the Jeep was also one that worked with the Jeep the guy had taken. To prove that he didn't mean to take the car, he put the key into the ignition, and sure enough, the key worked with both cars. Might have gotten a few details wrong, but it's still a crazy story. This poor guy must have been so confused, man. I would lose my mind if I found out my key worked with another car, let alone one in the same city, right where you would expect the other car to be. Like, what are the odds of that? Story 19. I work loss prevention for a major retailer. Working LP one day and I see a juvenile female selecting multiple items without looking at the price. Something that is a cue to me to start watching closely. She takes the cosmetics out of the packaging and then goes into the fitting room with one shirt. I get another officer to watch the cameras and I make my way out to the floor. The female exits and I check the stall. Nothing in there except a shirt. I head out to the entrance and wait for her to exit. As soon as she exits, I identify myself and ask her to return. The tears started running down her face and she begged me not to call her mom or the police. Told her that I would at least have to contact her mom. I call her mother and she says she is disabled and cannot get out of bed. I ask if there's anyone else that can pick her up and she sends a family member. During the interview with the female, she said she's having a really hard time and she's really, really sorry. Giving her the benefit of the doubt, I decide not to charge her on the grounds that she remains trespassed and doesn't get into trouble with any other retailer. She agrees. A few days later, I get an envelope with a letter. It says, thank you, and again how sorry she is. She explained the reason she took the cosmetics is because her mother has stage 4 cancer and only has weeks to live. She couldn't bring herself to ask for money from her mother because she's so sick and very broke. It honestly broke my heart. I framed the letter and keep it in my office as a reminder to not judge people quickly. Make all the new hires read it as well. Every one of them has the same who cut the onions in here look. OP did a good thing here. Like, work and loss prevention, it's your job, right? You gotta stop people from stealing from the store. Literally what you're hired for. But also having the empathy and understanding to just be like, hey, this person might be dealing with something I don't know about. And to not come down too hard on them and to just be like, hey, don't do it again. That's really respectable, in my opinion. People can make mistakes, get caught, and change. And those mistakes may be brought on by extenuating circumstances like this. I hope that person is doing better now. That situation must have had them in a pretty dark place, and it's not their fault. Story 20. Traveling to Australia and at customs, they swab my luggage and find traces of pot. At the time, I'm a 20-something guy with long hair traveling alone. A friendly customs fellow starts talking to me, gives me the spiel. They don't care if I smoke, just that I'm not bringing any, all that jazz. I'm 
freaking out while being politely interrogated at customs on the other side of the world, mind racing. Will I be turned away and have to go home? Will I be detained or jailed? Strip searched? I have no idea what Australian law has to say about drug trafficking, but it's probably bad. I never had smoked, not even once, and I still don't. I've dabbled slightly with legalization and all where I live, but it just makes me incredibly dizzy even at very low dose amounts. Both a vaping and one to two little four milligram edibles. Don't really drink either. Save for my best friend's wedding as the best man. Something about not having my wits about me really bothers me. But anyway, so here I am, freaking out, the poster child I'm sure, especially to some foreign guys probably familiar with American TV culture of an American pothead based on some appearance stereotypes, and it suddenly dawned on me. I was using my parents' suitcase for the trip. He gave me this kind of incredulous look, but we chatted a bit more. They searched my luggage more thoroughly, and I went on my way. I'm sure they thought I must have gotten through with something, and they just didn't bother to find it. But no, it really was someone else's suitcase, and my parents at that. Story 21. Telling this one third hand and 30 years later, so bear with me if the details are fuzzy. My mom had a friend, Mary, who owned an old Volkswagen Beetle. To those not in the know, those things had an engine in the back and a big trunk in the front. One day, the circus came to town. As part of the grand arrival, the elephants are paraded from the train station to the downtown market for a meal and photo op. Mary just happens to be driving down the street while the elephants are making their walk. One of the elephants gets a little out of control and decides to sit on her car. The front of the car was smushed, but it was still drivable. Couldn't get it fixed right away, though. I've seen pictures of the elephant sitting on the car, so I know this happened. A few days later, Mary is driving on a highway, and a massive 15-car pileup occurs right in front of her. Her car wasn't involved, but she was still stuck there until the highway gets cleared. As she's waiting, a cop is going down the line with all the drivers asking them questions. He finally gets to her car and asks why she didn't stop in time. She claims she did. Cop looks at her car and says, nah. -uh. Mary tells the cop about the elephant, and now he thinks she's delusional. Not sure how long it took her to convince him. If someone told me an elephant sat on their car, I would kind of have to believe it, I feel. Like, no one would use that excuse without it being true, right? It's just too absurd. Of course, that just means there's a different way to fool me, I guess. Story 22. I'm not a law enforcer, but when I was 21, I went to a public park to smoke weed with a group of my friends. I had weed in my car and papers to roll up joints, of which I rolled three to split between the six of us. While I sat in the car waiting for my friends to get there, I mistrusted a fart and crapped my pants. This park was about a mile and a half away from my house, so I drove back in a hurry. I was speeding, and got pulled over on the crossroad between my street and another for going 15 over. The cop approaches my car and after the typical, license and registration, takes a whiff and goes, what am I smelling? I make eye contact with him and tell him, Sir, I pooped in my pants and was speeding home before a date. The officer looked back to his car, leaned his head back in a bit and sniffed, pulled his head out and winced, slapped the side of my car twice and said, Hurry home, son, and let me go. Small miracles, I guess. Story 23. I was going 17 over and got pulled over going home for winter break from university. I had some Whataburger earlier, but all was well with my digestive tract until I got pulled over. I then realized I had to take a massive crap. So he comes up and I'm already ready with the papers and license. He asks me why I'm going so fast and if I'm aware my speed is a felony. I told him I'm on my way home, it's a pretty far drive, and that I have to go to the bathroom really badly and point at the Whataburger bag. He raised an eyebrow and I said, look, man, I'm gonna crap my brains out, can we do this in Coleman? This was just outside of Coleman, Texas, and Coleman has a decent all-subs convenience store for such purposes. He raised an eyebrow and off we went. He ran my info while I ran my pipes, and after I came out 15 minutes later, he told me to keep the speed down and to be safe heading home. It was a very strange series of events for me. We made it so, so far without any stories about crap, and then two in a row? Two in a row, really? Come on, Reddit. I guess I chose to read them, but hey, you're not allowed to blame me. I make the content. I read the stories. I don't make the content, I guess. I read the stories. Story 24. I was on foot patrol at the Lincoln Memorial when I received a call on the radio to meet with a woman concerning her kidnapping. As soon as I saw her from a hundred yards away, I could tell she was a 1096, mental subject. She was dressed inappropriately for the time of year. Her clothes were unusual and mismatched. Many homeless people wear all of their clothes because they have nowhere to keep them. Her hair was very disheveled. She proceeded to tell me that she had been kidnapped from the streets of DC the night before, but she escaped and made her way back. She told me she was kidnapped by 33rd degree masons under the orders of Jesse Jackson and the Rainbow Coalition. She told me she jumped out of the car in Virginia and hitchhiked back into DC. While I was taking her statement, a detective showed up. We found out she jumped out of the car at a convenience store. The detective went out to the convenience store and found out she had indeed been there the night before. Apparently some frat boys thought it would be funny to pick up a homeless woman and take her back to the house for a party. When she started talking to them about Masonic conspiracies, they decided to mess with her. She freaked out and they dumped her at the convenience store in the middle of the night. Alright, 
straight up pieces of garbage. Like, I'll be the first to admit it, I have biases against fraternities. But that completely aside, these people did just kidnap someone, and that really makes them pieces of garbage, regardless of this person's status of, like, homeless or not, or mentally stable or sane or not. Like, they just did a very bad thing. So, I hate those guys. Not a funny prank, not a funny anything, just awful to humanity. That being said, that's a, uh, wild story to hear as an officer, and even wilder to find out that it's somewhat true. And that story is also our last one for today. As such, I'd like to thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed the stories as much as I did, because there were some absolutely insane ones in here. And two about crap right at the very end. Ugh, oh, we were so close. It was gonna be a whole video with no crap mentioned. Nope, not quite. Anyway, for now, I hope you have a wonderful day, or night, wherever you are, and I'll see you in the next one.